And this is a story that I think we'll end on. It's a longer story, but it's one that find interesting that you would have a individual by the name of Roger House writing an opinion piece. Black people need a safe state in America. Let's make it Georgia. Black thinkers may want to weigh the merits of establishing a a majority-minority state as a political base while still demanding the rights of citizenship across the land. So here we have somebody calling for carving up the United States by racial lines so that black people can dominate the government of a state, not just a not just a city, not just a community, not just a school board, not just a municipality, not just Atlanta, but the entire state of Georgia. This is coming at a time where of course Buckhead is poised, uh, you know, one of the affluent Tony areas of Atlanta wants to secede from the city so they can have the tax revenue stay there as opposed to all of Atlanta. And they can actually have a police force that would protect the store owners as opposed to having the Atlanta PD, which has basically said, hey, we're not even gonna we're not even gonna have cops chase after fleeing vehicles, fleeing criminals. So let's look at this article by Roger House. Just a couple of the lines. We'll we'll read through this. Trial of three men accused of slaying Ahmed Arbery has black Americans walking on pins and needles once again. Whatever the jury decides, I'm afraid, will fail to address a damning question that the tragic incident symbolizes. How can black people ever be secure in America? Well, considering the fact that in most major cities where there's a significant black population, almost all homicides and non-fatal shootings are black on black, I don't know how blacks will ever be secure when they're in communities of their own in cities that already have highly segregated areas such as Milwaukee, Louisville, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, you name it, and Atlanta. The Aubrey encounter is just the latest in a series of violent racial incidents that linger in memory. George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, and Garner, and so many others. Fatal consequences are recounted on television and social media and trigger episodes of post-traumatic stress in the black psyche. Add to these graphic executions the racism inherent in the criminal justice system and the increasingly unstable antics of states under the spell of Trumpism, one can wonder if it's time for black Americans to to consider establishing a base for security. Such a conclusion runs counter to the direction of black politics since the Supreme Court's decision in the school desegregation cases. Nearly 70 years later, after uh, Brown versus B Board of Education, after generations of racial strife, the climate today suggests that new options may be worth pursuing. New century black thinkers may want to weigh the merits of establishing a majority-minority state as political base while still demanding the rights of citizenship across the land. So... We want a state of our own, but we still want to be able to live around you just in case the state of our own doesn't work. Got it, Mr. House. I do not make this suggestion lightly because I know the anxiety that self-determination schemes can trigger. Does it mean a return to separate but equal? I'm sure that whites would be really equal in this majority-minority black-controlled Georgia of Mr. House's fantasy. Going back to the article, the question, however, ignores the reality that for many, the separate status never ended or did so at a loss of culture. A project to create a black majority state would be in the political and cultural interest of the race, i.e. black people. There are examples of, in U.S. history, of vulnerable groups using the structure of federalism to create a safe haven state. Most notably, the Mormons in Utah. In fact, black pioneers resorted to the strategy when forming independent towns across the West, like Nicodemus, founded in Kansas in 1877. The effort to gain effective political control of a state would have advantages, like constitutional protections not afforded to cities. Most importantly, the powers of the offices of Governor, Attorney General, and Secretary of State, the appointment of judges, and an executive check on the overreach of white state legislatures. Well, who's going who's gonna to have an executive check on the overreach of a majority black state legislator? Uh, again, this is a, a racial state for us and not for, and not for you. Sorry, pal. Control of executive officers would further the development of technical experts with skills in public administration, policing, and lawmaking, and the direction of the political economy. They would have the ability to bargain with state economic interests and to generate a sustainable presence in the halls of Congress. Today, states with demographics favorable to majority-minority voting bloc are Mississippi, Louisiana, Maryland, South Carolina, and Georgia. Also, uh, so 
he goes back to these states and he says all these populations are over 30% or more black and have attracted new migrants in recent years. But he says the state that he wants and he, to focus on for uh, political racial migration would be the peach state, Georgia. Uh, it teeters on the brink of black political ascendancy due to the forces of migration organization. An estimated 1 million blacks have migrated south from cities that they, well, the, the great migration of blacks didn't really do that well in Buffalo, Rochester, and uh, Albany, and Detroit, and Milwaukee, and Baltimore, and Philadelphia. Cities aren't doing that great, but so I guess that the blacks who aren't doing well there are going to go back and see if they can do well in, in Georgia. And, and spoiler alert, Clayton County's majority black, got a lot of black elected officials. They've got a black police chief in Victor Hill who back in 2005 fired all the white cops when he became the first black sheriff of that county. Had him marched out with snipers on the, on the roof. Clayton County is one of the worst places in Georgia. And it's had, you know, it's had black administrators now for almost 15 years exclusively. So... With a population of more than 10 million, about 35% black, Georgia has become a purple state with the introduction of new voters and grassroots organization. Black Georgians have developed strong political organizations in secondary cities as well. The number of black mayors increased from 42 to 64 in recent years. Black mayors have assumed control of mid-sized cities like Augusta and Savannah. Smaller entities like Powder Springs, Douglasville, and Fayetteville, among others. So basically, uh, many black migrants in this writer's eyes bring needed skills, education, and independent sources of income. They include retirees on pension, self-employed, and remote workers, skilled tradesmen, professionals, and university students. Cause of political autonomy would be furthered by campaigns to better target the migration process and grow the, the voter base. Yes, he's talking about getting blacks to move to Georgia to engage in the great replacement of the dwindling white majority. Again, Georgia was 74% white in 1990, about 51, 52% white in 2021. He then writes, it could start by depicting the Peach State as a historic designation for refugee and contemporary site for economic opportunity and cultural vitality. So this guy writes about how, hey, the marketing could herald the state's role as an early symbol of black autonomy. Most people know about the civil rights legacy of Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Council Conference. Few, though, are well of the freedom struggles of Africans in the region. Uh, brought to labor in rice plantations of the Charleston colony, many escaped to the coastal swamps of Georgia. As early as 1680, it was an informal underground railroad that relied on settlements known as maroon colonies. Uh, it, it's interesting, I, I didn't even know this. In 1865, Union General William Tecumseh Sherman issued Field Order No. 15 that granted emancipated blacks, about one-third of the state. The order was later overturned by President Andrew Johnson once he assumed office after the assassination of President Lincoln. Again, could you imagine somebody arguing, hey, let's turn Idaho, let's turn, let's turn Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and uh, Montana, and Northern California into a white ethnic state. Immediately, that person would be canceled, and how dare you argue that such some that that would be something good that uh, white people had control of their own their own autonomy? Um, again, think think back to what this guy's writing in this piece. Quote: Control of executive offices would further development of technical experts with skills in public administration and policing, and lawmaking, and the direction of the political economy. No, what if you were talking about white people moving to a state? Say white people wanted to move to Maine or white people wanted to move to West Virginia or white people wanted to move to those states that I just mentioned, uh, Pacific Northwest or to Vermont or to New Hampshire or to Rhode Island or to start moving to Florida in mass. And they said, we're going to take over the local governments and we're going to have a government that, that, that reflected our interests. I mean, again, this is something that basically every facet of American life is presented against. And this piece, which was published in the Daily Beast under the headline, Black People Need a Safe State in America, Let's Make it Georgia. This piece was published by Roger House. I'm sorry, it was written by Roger House. It was published on November 21st, 2021. It ends with this.
It ends with this. And this is what I'll leave it. While the concerns were all serious, over time the advantages of establishing a majority-minority state could come to outweigh any potential disadvantages. What remains urgent is that the Ahmed Aubrey outrage is the latest testament to the intrusions of white supremacy and the need for a safe state. I don't, I you know, I, I wish there was a peaceful separation. It would be great. You know, the American Colonization Society were was an organization that was funded and staffed and had membership of pretty much all the great American luminaries from both the South and the North. Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, you name it, they were probably in it. And they realized that this, this whole concept wasn't going to work of racial equality. Notes of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson knew it too. Thomas Jefferson knew it too. And Roger House gets it. But at the same time, he wants to have access to be able to still have citizenship if all the African Americans move to Georgia and make it their own state. They still want to have access and citizenship throughout the country. You can't have it both ways. You can't advocate for racial separation while still having and clinging to some citizenship with the rest of the country in case your little scheme goes south. No pun intended. Because we know what happened in a place like Detroit. Detroit, its white population is increasing now. After being governed by governed by blacks exclusively roughly since 1973. Of course, they have a white mayor, and you've got Dan Gilbert, the CEO of Rocket Mortgage, who's, uh, I'm sorry, Quicken Loans, who's come in there and basically redeveloped the city and turned it into a place where I think his corporate headquarters is located. And it's, you know, it's, it's a security lockdown zone, so you can try and get gentrifiers to move in. But anyways, 